So how did the Small Communities Big Solution Conference happen? Well, the Alliance is made up of 10 presidents from higher education institutions in Southern West Virginia. Can you raise your hand? I know I have several presidents here today. And they, um, through the Alliance, uh, got together and said, we want to connect with our communities. Uh, we do so on a daily basis, but we want to do uh, so on a regional level. And we want to celebrate our community successes. Then we decided that we need to, to reach out to experts um, so that we were reporting on the right activities and embracing all the good deeds in Southern West Virginia. So Stephanie and Brandon, um, they were brought in and they are experts at, across West Virginia, in particular Southern West Virginia, and they helped to build an impressive program. I sincerely thank the President's Operation Council Stephanie and Brandon for working tirelessly on this conference. And I also want to thank our nine sponsors for supporting this endeavor. Appalachian Power, AARP, United Bank, Sodexo, Marshall Health, Savage Grant, N3, Marshall University Research Corporation, and West Virginia Executive Magazine. There would have been no way we could have pulled this together without the support. So I appreciate it. Everyone give a round for those sponsors. <laughs> now I want to tell you a little bit more about the Alliance. The presidents and the operation councils, we really struck gold when we created the Alliance. And I'm not saying literally because we don't have hardly any money. But what we do have <laughs> is a lot of passion compassion and knowledge that we can harness and that's really exciting to me indeed this conference is a result of a collaboration on a whole new level and i believe that the alliance is poised to grow and truly be become a, a wonderful state partner we can take on pilot programs and projects and implement them and we are here to tighten the bond between employers and Southern West Virginia higher education inst institutions. So that's what the Alliance is all about. We are project-based, results-driven. We don't want to duplicate efforts. We want to connect the dots. We want to fill in the gaps. We have handouts that tell you a little bit more about the Alliance and they are out in the lobby. So over the next two days, please uh, get a copy and learn more about us. Now, to the fun stuff. The rules for the conference. One, learn something new. Two, make five new connections. Three, take something back to your community. Four, Listen for my chime. If you hear it, that means the program is reconvening in this room. So please, mosey wherever you're at, mosey back in here and take a seat. Check at the schedule outside. It's also listed in your program, but check the, uh, the breakout session schedule. I've put a sheet in the windows of the three rooms that we'll be using. Room 136, 123, and 124. And please remember why we're here. We're here to celebrate. We're here to acknowledge the great things. Yes, we have challenges, but every state, every country, have they have challenges. We're here to push pause, take a deep breath, and celebrate where we've, uh, where we've been, where we are, and where we're heading. Celebrating success can be very powerful because it allows us the opportunity to reflect on the past, embrace the present, and become more dedicated to our future. And with that, I'd like to call Stephanie to Tyree to the stage. Thank you, Sarah. I'm Stephanie Tyree. I'm the Executive Director of the West Virginia Community Development Hub. I'm very happy to be here today and to be a partner on this conference. So thank you to the Alliance and to Sarah in particular for inviting us to be part of this. And for being a great partner and leader on this project. The West Virginia Community Development Hub is a statewide community development organization that's focused on working with small rural communities around the state to help them 
implement, hi Senator, uh, <laughs> help them implement their vision for the solutions that they know work in their communities. So when Sarah called me up and she said, we want to do this conference about small communities and big solutions, I said, that's our stuff. That's what we do every day. That's what we see as West Virginia. And that's what we're passionate about. We know that there are community leaders all over the state and particularly in Southern West Virginia that are, that are building a new future for our state. We feel like that story isn't told enough. And so we're thrilled that we have a sold out event today with a lot of different speakers, different leaders um, from Washington DC all the way to the smallest communities in West Virginia that are gonna share their stories and their visions. I wanted to just say a couple of things that I'm most excited about today. Um, one of the things that we're gonna be doing is really doing that work that Sarah said of meeting new people. So the Hub's gonna be leading a session today and a session tomorrow to get you up and networking and meeting new folks. So we're gonna have a little bit of energized networking activity both days. But the part that I'm most excited about for this conference is a new awards that we created called the Power of Performance Awards. One of the things that we wanted to do was to uplift and shine a spotlight on businesses, organizations, and individuals in Southern West Virginia who are day in, day out, transforming their communities and transforming our state. These are people that don't always get a lot of attention put on what they're doing. And so we created a Power Performance Award, which will be given out to six different individuals, businesses, and organizations over the next two days that we hope will introduce you to new leaders in West Virginia and will give us a chance to celebrate them. So again, thank you for having us as part of this. And um, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Brandon Dennison with Coalfield Development. My name is Brandon Dennison. I'm the CEO of Coalfield Development. Thank you all for being here. And also thank you to Sarah and Stephanie who really just make a phenomenal, a phenomenal team of uh, young West Virginia leaders. So, uh, Something I, I just want to share a brief reflection on is the word small. So I love what we've come up with as the name for this conference, small communities, big solutions. And um, I think sometimes we have a little bit of an inferiority complex in West Virginia. And sometimes I feel this. I was in New York City last week and you fly in to LaGuardia and you realize there are more people on that little island <laughs> than in our entire state. But um, a book that I would recommend to maybe flip our thinking a little bit is by Malcolm Gladwell. It's the same guy who wrote Outliers. It's called Dave and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. And what he helps us realize is that David actually had a lot of advantages. David could move quicker. David was more mobile. David could adapt to changing situations. And David had a better tool than what Goliath had. And so actually David you know, was, was primed for success and just had to have the courage to look at that confrontation a little bit differently and therefore had the advantage. So I think in West Virginia, our smallness is really just another way of saying tight-knit communities. And our smallness is another way of saying adaptable and resilient and creative. And if we can just harness the courage to face the challenges that we all know we have to face, then it's a, another way of, small is another way of saying successful in time. So um, thank you to all of you for just the creative and successful leaders that you are. And I feel really good just to have this positive energy and the solutions mindset all in the room together. And I can't wait to see what comes of it. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. You know, um, it, it's truly great to see everybody in this room to come together to share our successes and really to work together to create solutions to address the challenges of Southern West Virginia. And um, certainly uh, the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine is proud to be a part of this group and is part of the solution. Um, you know, our mission is, the, the WBSOM's mission is to serve first and foremost West Virginia and, and to address the healthcare needs of its citizens. And we do this by, first of all, graduating quality osteopathic physicians who serve this state, especially in rural areas. And in fact, we're the number one provider of rural docs for the state. And we're really proud of that. 
But WVSOM also has all kinds of programs that, uh, that are focused on community outreach. We're in the communities, working with the communities, and wanting to address their needs. And we do that through our rural health initiative, our Healthy Children's Initiative. We have a television show called Abracadabra that won an Emmy this summer uh, in trying to educate kids about nutrition and exercise. And actually for season six, we did an opioid ep episode that'll get released later in the year. But I wanna focus just a minute on our Center for Rural and Community Development, which is led by our dynamic executive director, Dr. Dreema Mace, who you'll hear from later. The center has numerous programs to address the healthcare needs of West Virginia. Uh, but I wanna focus on what we're doing to help with the opioid epidemic. You know, the center has put together a toolkit to educate people uh, throughout our communities about what this epidemic is all about. And we've already distributed that toolkit to Greenbrier, Boone, uh, Mercer, Kanawha, and Cabell counties. And we plan to, to continue to distribute, distribute it across the state. Um, we've done a health literacy campaign called the His and Her campaign, where again, we're, we create a scorecard uh, that we put in doctor's offices so that people can sort of see where they stand as it comes to substance uh, use and abuse. Um, we, we've done community forums. Uh, we recently did a national workshop that got uh, broadcast all over the country uh, in, in conjunction with USDA, USFTA, uh, National RTAP, and SAMHSA to again address uh, opioid misuse and transportation issues. And we're currently developing a community health worker training, training program that'll be online to, uh, to, to, that'll include substance use um, uh, prevention and recovery training. And we have lots of other programs and Dr. Mace is here at the conference and we'll share those successes with you and because we wanna share what we're doing and what we wanna know what you're doing. So another person who has been at the forefront of battling the opioid epidemic is our next speaker. And it is truly a pri privilege to introduce our next speaker who really doesn't need an introduction. Uh, most of you know him simply as Joe. And our senior United States Senator is well known for his accessibility. He's well known for his work in communities. He believes in something called retail government, where the government goes to the people, goes into the communities, and works for the people. He enjoys traveling the state that he loves so much. I mean, he is a fellow West Virginian and often speaks directly with West Virginians. And his staff also shares this same mentality. For example, every May, his Senate office travels to all 55 counties in one week making more than 100 stops along the way. And this is a proud tradition of his office. Senator Joe Manchin has spent years representing us in, in, in many different roles. And many of you know this, the state legislature, the, as Secretary of State, as governor of our great state, and now as US Senator. As our Senator, one of Joe Manchin's main priorities is fighting addiction and supporting recovery and reentry programs so individuals can truly get a second chance to be productive citizens, because that's really what it's all about. And we appreciate his efforts and leadership on this important issue. Joe Manchin is a respected ambassador for West Virginia and certainly a good friend of WVSOM, and I am honored to introduce him. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to West Virginia's senior senator, Joe Manchin. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's good. Please sit down. Sit down. Please. No, no. That's 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 very good. I appreciate that. Let me say to to Sarah, Brandon, and Stephanie, the three of you who collaborated to put this on. Thank you. Well, uh, well done, and uh, and. Uh, it needs to be continued. Uh, I don't have a formal speech. They give me one, but I don't use it. And uh, uh, because I don't need it on this subject for sure. Let me thank also Bluefield State, Mount West, 
Southern West Virginia, Marshall, Concord, and Bridge Valley for coming together on this collaboration. Uh, we got challenges. We do. I said, my goodness, we've never had so many challenges in the state of West Virginia, and we never had so many opportunities to really show the country that we can lift ourselves up, basically change who we are, and change the direction of this country. Um, I keep thinking of, of uh, how we got to where we did, where we are today. I, I don't know. I was um, Secretary of State. I'm just using the time of my state office from 2000 to 2004. I never saw this or never knew it was of such epidemic proportions, uh, the opiate addiction. Uh, I became governor in 2004 and took over in 2005. From 2005 to 2010, I saw signs of it, but nothing to the extent was the flag wasn't raised at that time. Uh, but we knew something was going on. Uh, then at, at the right at the end before Senator Byrd died, uh, I saw that we had serious problems. A little town that I know very well, Oceana, West Virginia, start being called Oceana. And I thought something's wrong, something's wrong. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and I knew it because my roommate was from Oceana, Joe Pendry, and we played ball together at WVU. So I went back down and I just couldn't believe it. It was devastating compared to what I remembered as a younger person. So I knew something had to be done. And people were talking to me. Kids were coming up. They were begging, please help us. My father got addicted. He worked in the mines. And they gave him these pain pills. And boom, before you knew it, we lost our home. My mom and dad are divorced. And it just went on and on and on. So um, then I go, to the, I go to, uh, to the Senate after Senator Byrd passed away. And the first thing I looked into, was the most, the most uh, widely used opiate was Vicodin and Lortab. Those were the two that were being passed out like M&Ms because they were Schedule Three drug. Schedule Three drug, and I'm thinking, Vicodin and Lortab, Schedule Three, it's opiate, why shouldn't it be Schedule Two? Schedule Two is 30, 30 days, Schedule Three is 180 days with no reoccurring visit to the doctor. It was just absolutely like the candy store of all candy stores. So I go, and I go before the uh, FDC, uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration, FDA. And uh, I go up to Baltimore, and, and I go before their, uh, as a senator, I go before their advisory committee, and I make the pitch. Why is this a Schedule Three when it's doing the same damage, and it's the same product as Schedule Two? Why would you allow it to be distributed in such vast quantities? Uh, and they voted, they, they, they agreed with me, and they voted to overwhelmingly make it a Schedule Two. That should have been, at the most, a three-week procedure to turn around. Took three years, three years. I never knew what we were running into. This is not a health model from the pharmaceutical industries, especially from the distributors. This is a business model, and that, that proved it, and I'll tell you how they proved it. I, I knew something, I said, this is ridiculous, and I kept calling up, and the lady, I won't use names, but the lady who was the commissioner of the FDA at the time, kept giving me every excuse in the world why it was taking so long. I said, it's ridiculous. First of all, I said, Schedule Two has to be locked up. It has to be in distri distribution areas where the big Cardinal Health, McKesson, and all them. And it was a big change. I said, it's not a changeover. You're just gonna take a drug that you have over here, because I went to the distributor places where they work, take that drug and put it behind that cage, that's all. Because they didn't want to make it available to the people that work, and you had to have security to get into the caged area, how they distribute their drugs. And I said, this is ridiculous. Then I found out the real reason. The real reason was her husband is a hedge fund investor, a hedge fund investor who invested heavily into the products I was trying to take from a Schedule Three to a Schedule Two. And he got promotion after promotion because they were doing so well in the business model. So I found out and I called Secretary of the DHHS in West Virginia, who I'm proud to say, and she, she worked quickly. And I, says, I said, Sylvia, I'm going to tell you what we found out. I'm going to call for a full investigation of the Senate investigation to take this place down. And I said, this person here has been stonewalling for the purpose of greed. And I said, you either get rid of her or we're going to have an investigation start in the morning. She was fired that night. Let's say she resigned that night. It's just awful. So the amount of money coming in to push these products, which are not needed. I don't need to tell Jeff and everybody else where, you know, where you don't need to look at West Virginia. Look at, look at Kermit. That's a real model. Brandon, what, five million pills in, in a town of 392 people? And you're telling me that's a health model that was needed? So that's what we've got. And we've gotten to where we've gotten to because of nobody was watching. No one was watching the store. The FDA is saying, here's a product. And you know, you know how the product come on the market, OxyContin, uh, as I'm told. But Veterans, Veterans Administration 
with all returning coming from deployment, they would come back to, and then they started asking at the VA clinics and the hospitals, what is your pain level? Pain level become the fifth element of wellness. Well, guess what? A miracle drug came on the market, a miracle drug. 24 hours of relief and no addiction, no side effects. It happened to be called Oxycontin. And Purdue Pharma says, we just, we've developed this wonderful drug for you. Well, it's been a product's been around for years and years and years, but it was basically administered in hospitals and it wasn't used outside of the market area of a, of a severe pain. So then I said, I can understand how we've gotten to epidemic proportions. You had the FDA, the Food Drug Administration, telling us product's safe. It's good. It does everything it's supposed to do. And then we had the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency. They're the ones responsible. They're the ones responsible for how much product comes into a market and basically to administer and basically to make sure that the distributors are reporting when excessive amounts are going into small areas and there could be illicit trade going on. That's their responsibility. Well, needless to say, I think you've probably seen different articles on that. There's a gentleman named Renesisi, Joe Renesisi, who blew the whistle and they fired him. And uh, we can't get any traction, but we finally got their attention and got traction because there were enough senators, Democrat and Republican. One thing about this drug, or this epidemic, it, 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 it doesn't have a home. It goes everywhere. Doesn't care whether you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, whether you vote or don't vote, whether you're conservative or liberal, could care less. If it can get you, it'll get you. And I said, this is the, there's only a few things that keep us bipartisan in, in Washington today. The one and the one mainstay has always been our military and our veterans. That's always been bipartisan. At the end of the day, we'll come together to make sure our military is properly equipped and properly trained and has the proper money to defend us. The second thing that's come on now is opiate addiction. We just passed a bill, 99 to 1. Can you believe that? 99 to 1, pass anything in Washington? 99 to 1? But we did because it is bipartisan now. It's a shame. So we're determined to, to, to change this. Uh, this last bill we have, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, has been charged uh, with using all their scientists, all the money and all the power they have to basically stimulate and incentivize all of the pharmaceutical manufacturers with all their brain power and their scientists to develop a new drug, something that basic is not opiate and does not have addictive properties to it. We know enough. If Vivitrol can, if you can get a shot for 29 days and it can block and stop, you would think they'd get a drug that would give you pain relief that wouldn't basically trigger the addiction. Seems pretty simple from someone that doesn't know what the heck's going on in the scientific world. But I said, that got, that's got to be done. So we're charging them to go in that direction. Let me just tell you the things I see in Southern West Virginia, uh, especially. Southern West Virginia got hit harder because we were one trick pony. We had, uh, we had basically extraction and that was it. We haven't diversified. We haven't been able to diversify because of the way, the terrain we have, who owns the property, how we have to work with the people that have basically control of mostly Southern West Virginia. So I've said this, <clears throat> I've told him, I said, if I could wave, wave my wand, I said, first of all, if you, lived in, if you lived in rural America in the 1930s, you probably didn't have electricity. Just, you know, rural, we're a capitalist society, we're gonna, basically the market's gonna go where the people are in a return on investment. That's where the government, no, no one likes government until you need it. Well, if, if it was left up to the private sector, you wouldn't have still electricity in, in areas because not enough people to justify a return on investment, to put a line to hook people up. So I said today, uh, Franklin Roosevelt gets elected in 1932 in the first 100 days, all these programs go into place because we've got to be one nation connected. And electricity was the way to do it at that time. Everyone should have the same opportunities and you had rural electrification. Today, if you live in rural America or rural West Virginia, you probably don't have broadband, high speed, or even cell service. It's the, it's, and then, so <clears throat> I started challenging the FCC, and I brought in the chairman of the FCC, and he kept saying, Joe, we got the maps, you got 91% coverage in West Virginia. I said, Tom, that's, that's crap, that is not accurate. So I said, meet me in Tucker County, at the Career Center Tucker County. That's not that far from DC, come meet me. So he comes, and, and uh, I'm on Commerce at the time, and uh, he comes, I say, hey, Tom, why don't you call back to the office? Call back and see if, you're, if you have any, any messages from your staff. And I said, you can use any phone you want to, any service. Grab anybody's phone, see if you can call. You couldn't get out. There's no service up there. But it showed that it was, it was in the frontier area. And I said, Tom, the problem we have right now, all of the carriers 
are, are, are basically uh, making their mark and claiming this is my area so they don't have any competition. And they're just going where the markets are. They're not going where they have to go and where we need. So now we have what we call um, uh, rural broadband connectivity. We're going to spend four point, we've got them to spend a dedicated $4.5 billion to rural America. $4.5 billion in 10 years. Now it depends on who, this is one thing, Brandon, all of you. You've got to get with our office because we're challenging every area. I know we're not connected, and I know Southern West Virginia is woefully not connect, connected, even though when I look at the FCC maps, they show big green areas of connectivity. So we're bringing people in, and, and where's Ryan right here? You can you get Ryan. Ryan, stand up so you can see who you are. Ryan's with my <laughs> – I got two Ryans. I got Ryan Palmer right back there. <laughs> Ryan, you stand up too. <clears throat> Ryan Palmer, Ryan Thorne, both of these. Ryan used to be with me and just does a wonderful job. Now he's with the feds, okay? Ryan Thorne is on the staff here with economic development. We'll come in. We'll bring the necessary equipment to check and be able to officially challenge the FCC. And if that official challenge is accepted, that we're able to bring in money and other areas and other people that can connect up an area when the main provider is not doing their job. So we put competition. Ryan, you gonna speak about that later? You got the professionals. I don't need to go any further. I'm just saying we're your connectivity because I challenge them. I'm, I think I'm the only office that's really challenged the FCC on that. So we're officially uh, recorded with them to be able to do that. Correct, Ryan? Yes. Okay. So please, that's one thing you can do. Next of all, <clears throat> King Cole Highway and Coalfields Expressway. You've got to have connectivity. And it's a shame because we don't have and the highway bills right now. They've been going year by year by year, CR by CR, continuing resolution. The country's been running on a CR for the last 15 years. Continu that's one year. That means you can, we, just, we can't come to agreement on a budget. We can't basically put our priorities and what we need, how we're going to run the country and have enough revenue and resources to do it. So in order to pass, kick the can down the road and pass the buck, they do a CR. That says, okay, next year you're able to spend what you did last year, but no more. So you can't plan. You can't build anything. We used to have five-year plans the FA, with the uh, uh, Road, uh, road F, uh, FAA and, and uh, the highway uh, program. And when I was governor, we could put a six-year program in. And we knew it because it took five to six years to build anything. We did Route 10. That's how we got Route 10. We got 35. We did, what we did is look at all the most dangerous roads we had to travel and uh, where most of our accidents were and try to do it along those lines. Uh, we did the infrastructure council. Uh, you know, the infrastructure council that we put in for the state basically is meeting water and sewer. And it's still absolutely inadequate. <clears throat> we had a lot of areas didn't want to pay the average rate of $36 for the first 3000 That was the biggest problem because they just been a supplement to all the people. And, and we've got to get those up to where anyone that's going to pay the, net, the state average should be as highest priority to be connectivity for water expansion. So those are all things need to be done. The big thing that I kept I'm fighting for, and I told Bill and Hillary Clinton this back when, when they were in the thick of things, they said, what can we do for West Virginia? I said, let me tell you what you, I, just what I mentioned, I mentioned high-speed broadband cell service. I mentioned King Coal and Coal Fields because we'll never have the resources to do that. That's going to be a federal program. The Appalachian Region Commission is, a, is the perfect tool for us to use. It's a, it's, it's a facilitator. We can use that because it's basically to stop poverty in Appalachia. We're the only state totally engrossed with 55 counties, and, it's, and we're close enough and we're small enough that they can try and they can give us waivers off of some of the stringent requirements they have of how you do it. And that gets me into this before I go into the other thing, or the final thing I threw at them. Uh, I want each one of you all, what you should be doing this, these two days you're going to be together, put your priorities of what is the, the biggest obstacle you have in federal, state, and local government. What's prohibiting you from doing a better job? What, because what, I can tell you, no matter what you think, Democrats and Republicans, everybody wants to do good. I really believe that. I don't care what politics. If you have a, if you have a calling for public service, then public service is truly serving the public, not yourself. And I say a majority of the people in government today are still public servants. They're just basically been lamb blasted by all this crazy stuff going on in Washington. But <clears throat> the feds, when we pass something and it finally gets passed, it's truly trying to help. By the time it passes all the hands of writing the bills, the rules and regulations, we don't know what the heck comes out. We really don't know what you're all getting on the front lines once our intentions were really honorable on the top end. That's where you have to say, hey, 
I, I know what you thought. This didn't work. This is not working. I'm not getting the help. I don't have the resources. I don't have the treatment centers. I don't have drug courts. I don't have day reporting. I don't have any money to help. And you're taking money away from us stopping the products coming into the market. So we need help. That's where you all can do it. Where the rubber hits the road on, on Main Street is what you all have to feed back. So if you do nothing more than this two days, tell us what's not working, what is working, and how what we can enhance, what is working, what's not working on the federal, state, and local level. That would help us. Back to Hillary and Bill. So I said, Hillary, we'll never build King Coal, we'll never build Coalfield. We'll talk about it. We'll build a mile here and a mile there. We've been 40 miles, 40 years trying to build Quarter H. Even with all the push that Senator Byrd was giving us. 40 years, still not done. But if we don't do something in Southern West Virginia, God help us, because there's 12 counties. We'll, we'll be 50th in everything. There's so many good people down there, and there's so many smart people that's come out of that area that can help us. Jeff and them knows what's going on with, with Hatfield McCoy. Okay, it's been unbelievable. It's been unbelievable what's been happening in the tourism. I told Hillary, I says, we need a major project. We need a, we need a, we need a, uh, a rocket shot. And uh, she says, what is it? And I said, we need a large, a truly a large uh, hydroelectric dam. We need to have resources put in this area, the same as was done back in electrifying, you know, you, uh, for uh, rural electrification. I says, you build that. If the federal government comes in here from all the mined out areas, if you ever wanted to help, help Appalachia, that would be the one thing that I think can do it and would change the landscape. I says, on the size of a Smith Mountain Lake, maybe not quite as large, but on that type of a grand size, take the revenue that comes from the hydroelectric and share it with the counties most affected in the areas that lost most of their jobs. I said, that would be a game changer for West Virginia. It would bring us back into the normal of 25th and 30th in all good and bad categories, rather than 50th and 1st. So these are the type of things I'm still working on that as hard as I can because I really think the Appalachian Region Commission, that could be its shining star. Even the corridors, you know, they, they've done a lot of the, the highways and the interstates and this and that, but that would be the shining star of really showing what the Appalachian Regional Commission was meant to do. So, Brandon, what you're doing, I, I, I follow you very closely. I, I really, it's tremendous. But you're picking people up and giving them a chance. They're getting hope again that they can get back into it. The other thing I think very strongly about is a dual system in education. And I'm not talking just higher education. I think by seventh or eighth grade, we should identify a child that's gonna go down the academia route or go down the basically skill set route. And I'll give you a perfect example. Again, this was in Southern West Virginia. When I was governor, and we were just getting computers in all the schools and labs and everything. Um, one, of the, one of the principals called and she says, Joe, she says, I've been waiting for RISA, for the RISA people to come help set our labs up. We just don't, this is pretty new, back in 2005 or so, and we're responsible and I just need some help. And she says, I, I, they're just on a waiting list, I can't get them, and I can't get my labs set up and running. So she says, she was talking and there was the kids, some kids in, in, in the, in the uh, office there and heard her stop talking about needing to get computers set up. And I'll just use her name, Timmy. And she says, and one girl, one girl says, well, why don't you go talk to Timmy over there? He's 15 years old. She says, you mean the kid that doesn't get involved won't talk? He's just waiting to be 16 to drop out? And she says, yeah, I think you'd be surprised. Go talk to Tim. So they went and talked to him and Timmy not only set up the lab, Timmy's now a computer scientist. They found, they just found him. That little niche was there. And that's what I'm saying. You get a kid down, when they graduate from high school, they should have basically a diploma that they met the curriculum, but also an associate degree that they're working, ready to go into the workforce. Because we're losing them. We are losing them. We lose them either at 16 because no one grabbed them early enough, or we losing them at 18 because we either push them on to college, they would push them on to where they basically borrowed the money because the Stafford loan allows them to borrow so much money. They're head over heels in debt by the time the second year, and next all they drop out or flunk out, and then we lose them again. So we've got to change. And I'm just saying what we're fighting right now is something that you all have come together to address. Just put, some, just put some common sense to what's not working and what could help you to work. And it's up to me and Shelley and all of us to go fight. Her and I are both on, uh, on approps. Do you know how unusual that is? We're the only state that has two people on approps of 50 because most of the states have either senators from the same party or not. 
when Senator Byrd and Senator Rockefeller, for years and years and years and years, it was only Senator Byrd. They usually split them up. They don't let two from the same party. They split your part. Her being from the Republican Party, me being from the Democrat Party, we both requested the same thing and got it. So we sat there. And the beauty about it is, Shelly and I don't look at it. Oh, this will help the party. Heck with the parties. If we know something's for West Virginia and you're, you're talking to both of us, we get together and I said, Shelly, this is what's needed. Are you getting the same feedback? She said, yep, that's my number one too. That makes all the difference in the world. When we go and talk to Shelby, Richard Shelby from Alabama, and talk to Pat Leahy uh, from Vermont and say, hey, guess what? Ours is easy. We're not competing at all. Her and I want the same thing. It works beautiful. And that's what you have to use is to your advantage. So only thing I can tell you is I don't need to tell you statistics of how bad they are and the people that are dying. And it's a shame. It is absolutely a shame for us to be in a position to be ground zero on this epidemic. Matt Boggs is here, and, and Matt knows how I feel about him and what he's been able to do. But it's basically giving people a chance. So there's two things. We don't have enough treatment centers. You, you, every one of your communities you're, you're from or you represent or you go down and work with, they'll all tell you they need treatment centers, correct? Everybody feel the same? Guess what? We don't have any permanent funding for treatment centers. You're working year to year on appropriations. We haven't put any permanent funding in. Permanent funding means there has to be a permanent revenue stream. So I came up with a bill and I says, well, why not make the pharmaceuticals who are producing a product that they know is damaging America and killing us, why not make them pay? Why shouldn't they? They created a problem. So I came up with a lifeboat. I want every pharmaceutical that wants to produce a manufacturing fee, that wants to produce an opiate to pay one penny per milligram. One penny, that's all, per milligram. If you want to make this product, and I, you know what it's going to do to our country and to my state? I want one penny per milligram. Do you know how much that one penny produces a year? Over $2 billion. $2 billion a year. That's going to be permanent funding that we have that every, every area that's been mostly affected, the most affected areas, are going to have treatment centers with a permanent funding base. You get a permanent funding base, you can make it. So we're working on that one. And then we have another bill called Last Chance. The biggest thing, and it's because of math. Matt says, Joe, give me a little carrot. I need a carrot. And I said, what do you mean, Matt? He says, Joe, he says, when people are coming through recovery and we're getting them from an absolute deplorable spot in their life or position in their life where they don't have any hope or faith, and we're starting to get them cleaned up a little bit and their mind gets a little bit clearer, reality sets in. What am I going to do, right? I got felony. Most of them all have a felony. Most of us for larceny. So, uh, so they have a felony, and people aren't going to hire with a, with a record. So this bill here, Last Chance, says this, and it's because of Matt and people like Matt who brought it to me. And I think sentencing guidelines are going to be changed. We've got Democrats and Republicans understanding we're putting people in jail, and we're putting people in jail for far too long that did not commit a, a violent crime or did not commit a, a sexual crime, strictly a crime to support the addiction that they had. And we have to look at that differently. And a lot of politicians are afraid because they're saying, oh, uh, I'm, I'm concerned because that'll be weak. I'll show them weak on. Hell, back in the 80s, we were putting people away. If I was in the state legislature in the 80s and you wanted five years for how many grams of possession, I've just said, well, my God, let's give them 10 years. That's even better. That means I'm tougher on crime. And we were tough. We were stupid as could be and tough. <laughs> stupid and tough is what we were. And guess what? They came out in worse shape and they went in. And it just the cycle just continued to to uh, represent itself in many ways. This bill basically says this. If you go through a one-year program, a treatment, you come out of that program clean, and your sponsors know you're clean, and the second year you go into a mentoring ship to show that you're committed to staying clean and helping other people, then you should be able to go with your sponsor, with your sponsor, and go to your arresting officer and your sentencing judge to see if it can be absolutely disparaged. One time, last chance, cleans up your record completely if it was strictly on, on larceny and you have a felony for larceny supporting your habit. We could put so many very intelligent, very smart people back into the workforce. And I think this is what we're working for. So common sense. We, I think you all have a copy. We, did we pass out a copy? Yeah, I see them. You have copies of bills. Would look at any of these things you think would help. Uh, so with that being said, I've talked long enough, but... 
I can't thank you enough for what you're doing, just being here. So I'll leave you with this. And I, and I still, I'm so proud of our state. And I believe, I've said this, I believe in you more than you believe in yourself. And I know that you know. Is that the bell to get out? <laughs> I believe it. She's never changed. She's been working for me forever. And come here, come here, babe. This one here has been with me since she was in college. Okay, and now she's moved up to bigger and better things with Marshall University. I'm so proud of her, but Sarah has been wonderful. Uh, with that, I just want to leave you with this. Um, we just got to get that West Virginia pride back, who we are. My God, we've done so much. So I tell kids all the time, I go to the schools, and I say, listen, I know when you travel, you go with your mom and dad or go anywhere, uh, you're, uh, people ask you where you're from, and you tell them, and they say, is that close to Richmond? And we hear that. And then they make, a lot, they make a joke, or we'll make a joke about ourselves. So I said, here's what I want you to say. The next time you travel out of state and you know it's going to come, the question, I want you to take a deep breath and puff up your chest and say, uh, they say, where are you from? Oh, let me tell you. I'm from the most patriotic state in the nation. We got more veterans per capita. We fought more wars and conflicts, shed more blood, lost more lives for the cause of freedom. Our little, our, my little state was born out of the Civil War. And then to prove our, our, our uh, commitment to our state and the patriotism we have, I said, if you look on the wall of the Vietnam, there's unfortunately more West Virginia names than any others, any other state per capita. And I says, next of all, we've done all the heavy lifting. We've done all the timbering that built most of the Northeast after the Civil War. I said, we've done the drilling, we've done the mining, we mined the coal that made the steel that built the guns and ships, that basically built the middle class, built the factories. We've done everything this little state this little country has asked us, and we've become the superpower of the world because of the contribution to my state. And on top of that, the good Lord blessed us with the greatest scenery you've ever seen. My little state's called West Virginia, and when you come, you'll probably want to stay. Thank you. God bless you. I love West Virginia. I'm passionate about this mission and this sort of next phase of my life, second career, whatever. And I will tell you that you know the development office has some fantastic folks who have been there doing their job for a long time, and many of you all already know that, so I'm just sort of repeating that issue, but but there are a lot of great things in process, and I'm still you know working to get my hands around it. I'm from Southern West Virginia, from Fayette County, Mount Hope, and so I love this effort. This is all about my heart, and, you know where I came from. So I'm here to introduce um, our senator, and I think many of you all know um, her and know about her. But let me just give you a couple of things. Um, 2014, she was elected as the first female senator in West Virginia. And um, you know, over the years, she has 22 years of you know, public service representing us in now Washington for the past 18 years. Um, I will tell you, curiously, that she was the first Republican senator to be elected in the state of West Virginia since the 1950s. And my grandfather, Chapman Revercombe, was her former predecessor as the last Republican senator from West Virginia. So a little connectivity there. Um, you know, Shelley understands that we really need, the challenges of today need bipartisan solutions and cooperation across the aisle. And she's very fair and willing to understand both sides of the story. Um, she serves on a number of important committees. So let me just go over those really quickly. The Senate Appropriations Committee, Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, the Environment and Public Works Committee, Rules and Administration Committee. It sounds like she's representing the stuff that's very important to us in the state of West Virginia, right? So a couple of other things about Shelley. Um, of course, a lifelong West Virginian. She uh, grew up in Glendale, um, graduated from Duke University with a BS in zoology. Does anyone know what zoology really is? <laughs> I'm not sure I do, so ask the question. She also has her master's in education from the University of Virginia. And at this point, I would have to tell you, Gosh, Shelly, what about that score this weekend? UVA 28, Duke 14? Oh, I'm a UVA grad. And, and uh, over the years, we've had a little competition about this. Although she has degrees from both institutions, she's a Duke Blue Devil through and through. Um, she has six grandchildren, of which she's very proud. And um, I can tell you that she's competitive, she's passionate, she's professional. She's serious about her responsibility of representing West Virginia. She's accessible, she's fair and balanced. And uh, I thought about some little funny story I might tell that I actually got to see. 
playing golf a couple of years ago, my brother and I and her husband Charlie and Shelly, and we were at the time we were maybe having a little competition. On this particular hole, I think Shelly and Charlie were against each other. And Charlie said she had maybe a 25, 30 foot putt, downhill, big curve, so forth and so on. And Charlie said, okay, Shell, try to get it close. That's a challenge to her. He laid down the gauntlet. Guess what? She got determined, she made the putt, and just looked at him and said, there you go, game on. <laughs> so with that, please welcome our senator, Shelly Mortacco. tell you how happy I can say personally I am that you're at the helm of the development office in the state of West Virginia. You have great business experience, obviously good people skills, um, but you have a passion for the state that we all enjoy probably in this room, that we really need you to be there at the forefront uh, working with what I think is potentially a really exciting part of time for our state. And so Good luck to you. We want to be your partner. We want to work with you any way that we can. Um, I'd forgotten about that golf shot, but I mean, heck, when you're playing against your husband, of course you're going to do as good you can do. I mean, I had a funny story one time from um, when I was on the Financial Services Committee in the House, and uh, I was on that committee for the 14 years that I was there, and my husband works in the financial services sector and had for at that point, 30 years, and now he's on 40 years. And, and USA Today called one time, and they were stirring it up. It was probably election year, just like it is now, saying, it's a conflict, it's a conflict. She can't have anything to do with financial services because her husband works for, for, for a financial services firm, and, she, you know, that would be a conflict. He's certainly going to be, uh, you know, uh, pillow talking with her and telling her what to do. And I was sort of caught off guard by the question when I talked to the reporter, and the reporter says, and what do you, what, what's your response to this? And I said, well, I, he is with the financial sector, and I am on financial services, but who listens to their husband? <laughs> so they actually printed that. I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure how it was going to come out, but, uh, you know, not too bad. I, 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 thought, I thought it was pretty good. I know you had Senator Manchin this morning, and I, I hope that, and I'm sure that he did, uh, talk about how we work together. Senator Manchin and I have a great relationship, as you know, all politics aside, we do. Uh, he often likes to say that sometimes uh, the two of us get to, to get, get along better as a Republican and a Democrat than some of our other fellow members who have the same party from the same state. So uh, one of the issues that I've been on the forefront of, and, and when Sarah, thank you for the invitation to speak today, um, was to talk about broadband. And my passion there, and I, I think he did talk a little bit about it today. I'm going to talk a little bit about a program I put together called Capito Connect. Nice ring to it, I thought. But I realized once I started running statewide, uh, I realized how left out so many portions of our state really are. And it just gets has gotten reinforced to me more than a few times. Uh, I do with things in the classroom, and I'll ask the students, when you take your when you when you go home at night, can you do your can you do your um, homework at home? Uh, who has the connectivity to do it? And and sometimes it'll just be half the room will raise their hand. Well, you know, living in and around the Kanawha Valley and, and going back and forth to Washington, you don't really see that. But it is, as you all know, uh, business people, educators, and others uh, know how very difficult that is. There's a study that came out that I think 56% of West Virginia is, well, it says 43% of rural West Virginians don't have access um, that meets the, the minimum um, um, FCC uh, broadcast, I mean benchmarks. And so I know that there are a lot of people in this room. I just saw, I see Bob back there in the back. We didn't, Charlie, we just had a, Charlie, um, there he is. Uh, we just had a meeting earlier last week to talk about a new idea, some new ideas on how to expand broadband. I mean, we've been able to do have some successes. I, the, the reason I picked this as sort of my passion is because it's so measurable. You either have it or you don't. I mean, it's, I mean they can say it's in degrees, yes, but it's, it's a measurable thought. So I thought, I, I can really make a difference here. We, we've been able to get cellular service in little places like 
in Paw Paw and in Lincoln County. We were able to work on a multi-million dollar grant for some counties, Barber, Randolph, and Upshur. I'm sure they're in the room because I just talked with somebody to expand uh, broadband to 4,000 folks. We've had numerous meetings here with FCC officials. Senator Manchin has as well uh, so, uh, to have listening sessions. And I created a broadband caucus, bipartisan broadband caucus with Angus King from Maine, uh, with Amy Klobuchar from um, Wisconsin, from, oh no, she's from Minnesota. Uh, uh, John Bozeman from Arkansas, uh, Heidi Heidkamp from North Dakota. We all have the same, although interestingly, North Dakota has really good connectivity. Maybe because it's, I don't know, maybe it's flatter, there's not as many people, but they have really good connectivity. So what we've done with these bipartisan meetings, and some of you in the room have helped us come and testify, is we've kind of broken it down to where is this impact. Well, economic development, we know. You're not going to cite a business. You're not going to bring new, um, new uh, I'll use Core 10 as a business in Huntington, co coming to Huntington if you didn't have the connectivity there, and also, the, uh, also Marshall University, which is the big draw as well. You're not going to be able to draw in the new jobs, the transitional that as we transition out of energy, the new the new economy that we see. So economic development is sort of the number one, but it also is uh, education, as I spoke about, um, uh, telehealth. We've we've been down to see some of the uh, impacts of telehealth. Uh, I did a thing in Clay County at the health screening where they were screening me at the CAMC. General, my eye, it was a retinal scan, I guess, or something like that. So you could, you know, you could have your professional sitting in Charleston, your ophthalmologist sitting in Charleston while you're at the, at the community health center in Clay, uh, reading that x-ray. And, and so um, agriculture, precision <laughs> agriculture, this may not work in West Virginia as well, but uh, in these big states that have big ag, they're out on a tractor for the day. If they have precision agriculture and connectivity, they're able to maximize their agricultural output to a, a great degree. So we try to get all these different um, aspects. Tourism's another one. I learned by being in Fayette County that, yep, everybody, people want to unplug and ride the river and hike and do the zip lines and all that, but when they get back to their cabin, they want to reconnect in most cases. They want to reconnect, either do a little bit of work or stream something or um, just uh, carry on the business of the day. So uh, I, I, this is where I've put, I had my staff put together everything I'd done in, um, this is only 2018, I was amazed at everything I'd done, quite frankly, but um, one, I was like, wow, I did all that? But uh, one of the things we've done with, with um, Hassan from New Hampshire is to try to make sure that connectivity means the same thing everywhere. If I'm sitting at Union Square in New York City, does it mean the same thing as if I'm sitting in Hamlin in West Virginia? Are the standards the same? Am I being judged the same? Are the dollars gonna go to up her connectivity in Union Square or their activity in Union Square and just bring uh, Hamlin's up to a minimal status? Then that's not, that's not an, uh, an equal playing field. So Hassan, who's from New Hampshire, obviously a lot of rural areas, She's a Democrat, we work together. I'm, I keep emphasizing that we are working together because I just had a conversation out in the hall wondering if we ever work together. And, and, and I want to reassure you that we absolutely do. Senator Manchin and I have announced several grants, one to uh, a USDA grant to the Lincoln County Board of Ed to invest in video conference technologies. I'm just using a few of these. Also the mapping area, did he get into the mapping area? Where the way they map whether you have connectivity, whether the FCC has mapped it, is you have these census tracts. Well, if you're in a census tract and one person is served, then they count the whole census tract as being served. Well, if you're gonna be a provider and you're gonna extend <laughs> service, where are you gonna extend it to, to get it served? Well, you're gonna go to the easiest spot because it's less expensive and more economical for you and, and meets the metrics of the FCC. So now the Department of Commerce is gonna be doing the mapping and uh, hopefully we're gonna get some more accurate maps, which every state in the union has a problem with the mapping, in particular in the, um, in the, uh, in the rural areas. I work with Senator King, who's an independent from Maine. Uh, we work, we're working on the uh, education aspect of connectivity, and we actually uh, commissioned a study through uh, the, uh, we're asked for a study in the Every Student Succeeds Act which details key findings that highlight the pervasive use of computers as a learning tool. In other words, let's find out where the gaps are in learning and how much it's really used. And it's, it exceeded probably, the, the report came back that, um, 
the uh, edu education, uh, the tool of, of, um, of a computer or a uh, mobile device in education is, can't be undersold. So those are just some of the highlights uh, of what we've been doing. We've been talking a lot about 5G deployment. Here again, if we're going to deploy 5G, where are we going to be? Where are we going to be at Bridge Valley in Montgomery? Are we going to be at, we're going to have 5G there, or are we going to have to wait until everybody else has 8G, and then we're going to finally get 5G? So these are the kinds of things that we keep trying to highlight in terms of the rural broadband access. The Department of uh, Agriculture has come out with massive 423 million for rural broadband loan and grant programs, 53 million in distance learning, and 20 million dedicated to assist rural communities to combat the uh, opioid epidemic. So ag is transitioning their rural utility service to mean connectivity. And uh, we've been with the uh, Department of Ag, we did a swing through the state of West Virginia to make sure that we highlight the areas that we need. So we need your help on this, because you all know where and how the problems are and where they exist. So that's one of the areas I wanted to talk about. The other thing is um, opportunity zones. Uh, I don't know, I uh, had a meeting this morning in Charleston, had a great meeting in Huntington several weeks ago with Senator Tim Scott came in and we walked the streets of Huntington. And uh, one of the aspects of the uh, tax cuts bill that we passed in December is the creation of an op opportunity zones. The, the governor has to designate an opportunity zone. The, our governor has designated 55 opportunity zones, three in Huntington, four in Charleston, two in South Charleston, for instance. They're all over the state. In those, uh, Brandon's uh, Coalfield Development is in an opportunity zone, use that as an example. Okay, so great, we're designated, we already know we're in a distressed community, thanks. What it, what's that mean? What that means is, at the same time you, you designate an opportunity zone, these opportunity funds are being created. Opportunity funds, and I'm gonna give you just the high level, are, um, investment, private dollar investment opportunities, funds, where you can defray, and this would be for somebody who sold a business or very wealthy people or very wealthy funds, they can defray their capital gains tax. So if you stay in an opportunity fund for 10 years, you're not gonna have to pay any, uh, any capital gains taxes at all. So what does this mean for West Virginia? This is what I think it means. I think it means an opportunity for us to, I keep using that word, an opportunity for us to uh, attract private dollars into areas that are ripe for investment, whether it's mixed use, whether it's residential, whether it's, um, um, however, it's very broad what you, can, what you can invest in from an opportunity fund. And I know I'll use Huntington as an example because we went down there. They've, they've got a committee together. I know Patrick's on the committee and others where they're working together to try to formulate really, hate to use the word, but shovel-ready projects that are ready for opportunity funds. You don't have to have an opportunity fund from West Virginia. You can attract funds from everywhere. But that's going to be a challenge because we're going to be competing with 8,000 other opportunity zones across the country. So for those of you who are looking at your regions or your counties or your cities, uh, most of the cities, Parkersburg, Wheeling, Morgantown, Charleston, Clarksburg, Fairmont, Martinsburg, all have opportunity zones. You can pull the map up by looking, I'm sure, uh, at the website at the Department of Commerce. But we wanna help you with this. And Aaron Spork in my office, who I hope most of you in this room probably know, Aaron, raise your hand over there. Aaron has been honchoing this for me. I'm excited about this. You can. You can couple them with um, historic tax credits, with uh, low income tax, low income uh, housing tax credits, and also with um, uh, new markets tax credits. So it's not just one opportunity. And I, I just want us to be ready for this opportunity because not only do I think that the tax bill is having great effect, I voted for it, I think it's having great effect. Our unemployment is at its lowest level since 1969. Um, for, 0.2 million jobs have been created because of this tax bill. We see in West Virginia, when we see our tax base rising, that means that people have more disposable income and they're spending more money at a store, or they're buying a new house, or they're, uh, and their wages are going up for the first time in a long time. Maybe not as much as we'd like, but they are rising. And that, I think, is, um, is a part of the uh, results of the tax bill that we passed. So we wanna capitalize on that, capitalize through these opportunity zones, 
expand our broadband availabilities and, uh, and make sure that uh, at the same time face what we know is a crisis. We're, I'm going over to Washington on Wednesday. The president's going to sign the new, it's called Support Act. It's an opioid crisis response act. It's very broad, very big. And a lot of what's in there has been modeled after some of the successes that we've already seen in West Virginia in dealing with this issue. So uh, there again, uh, that's, a, I think, a good example where you see us fighting there all the time. Yes, we do that. But at the same time, we do lay our arms down and we do, uh, I think, move forward. We just reauthorized the FAA. It hadn't been reauthorized for like 20 years. We, we also still, I think, want to go back for an infrastructure package which would really meld nicely with what our roads for prosperity. See, advertising works. I remembered that. Um, I, I give Hoppy Kirchival, first of all, the, uh, he gets the best one though, fix the damn roads, remember that? <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, but anyway, if we got a national infrastructure package, it would really meld well with what we're doing at the state because we'd be able to use some of those state funds to match the federal dollars because states always, and our state's no exception, always has issues with matching dollars. So if we can get this infrastructure bill passed after the election, I think it would be a good thing. It'd be a good thing for the Congress. It'd be good for the president. It'd be good for our regions. And in that, I have specified, it's got to, broadband has got to be a part of the infrastructure. It just can't be roads and bridges and dams and everything else. It's got to include the, the new stool of, of infrastructure, which is, of course, uh, broadband connectivity. So with that, I'll just say it's an honor to be your senator. I know you've got a great big program. It is uh, great to hear both uh, Senator Capito and Senator Manchin talk about what's happening and, and the things that they've done related to uh, trying to advance broadband and how it fits and hits health care, education, and all the realms that it hits. Um, in 2016, uh, West Virginia the West Virginia Legislature voiced its uh, strong support for the expansion of uh, broadband through the creation of the West Virginia Broadband Enhancement Council. With this action, West Virginia singled, uh, uh, signaled its uh, willingness to fundamentally change the way we approach broadband development. And as a state center, senator, I um, understand that West Virginia can no longer settle for internet service that does not support the needs of residents and businesses. And um, as Sarah said, I sit as a, an advisory member of the council on behalf of the entire council. I want to extend my appreciation to the many state and federal partners who support this critical initiative. Among our strongest supporters was, is Senator Capito. Senator Capito has been a leader in this. She has long recognized the need for critical infrastructure and is a champion for the initiatives needed uh, to put West Virginia on the positive side of the digital divide. Uh, Senator Manchin also understands that broadband is vital to the state's ability to grow and compete in the digital economy. And it's really nice to hear both of them, and I've met with them individually and collectively. They do work well together. They do a great job and it is something that is needed, and particularly when we look at Southern West Virginia, this is needed in the worst way in Southern West Virginia. Numerous members of the West Virginia, West Virginia legislature has taken steps to ensure the policies in West Virginia reflect the state's needs for greater connectivity. I'd like to, to really talk about two. Uh, one is the uh, newly elected House Speaker, Roger Hanshaw, and Delegate John Schott among the most visible supporters. And I, I will tell you, if, if it wasn't for particularly uh, Speaker Hanshaw's leadership in getting 3093 and then the development of the, the bills past that, we wouldn't be talking about some of the advancements that we're, we're gonna be talking here. Over the past two years, the Broadband Council has picked up this mantle and formed partnerships with numerous state and federal agencies in multiple organizations uh, united in the recognition of West Virginia to deserve better access to broadband internet service. Uh, recently, um, Charlie Denny and I, and I hate to point him out because uh, he'll be a marked man now, uh, you know, that, uh, but we were in uh, DC and uh, we were at a Shelby conference, a school uh, health libraries broadband coalition. 
And uh, Catherine DeWitt with Pew uh, Trust, and if you know Pew Trust, Pew Trust from a national perspective, from a lot of perspectives, when I've worked on early childhood, they were deeply involved in what you did in early uh, care and education and how the state looks and how it ranks. And, and I had uh, visited with her for about an uh, hour and when I was at a conference in Los Angeles. And I told her that, look at West Virginia, look where we are on broadband, look at the policies that we've put in place to see where we are now. And she stopped Charlie and I, and she said, uh, you know something, a lot of people in the legislature tell us, look at these policies, and we go back and look at them, and they're not as good as they say they are. And she said, you know, I looked at your policies, and I've looked at what you've done in West Virginia, and it is far greater than what you even said that. Now, Charlie says I'm a salesman, but I undersold this, evidently, because she said, I've been looking at this, and I know that she's been interviewing other people, but we've made great progress on this. What's missing and what has been missing is the federal partner, and I think the key to this initiative, I could go through a number of the things that the broadband uh, council has done, but I, I think it's better to bring up the speaker because the key initiative is the support of the Federal Com uh, Communications Commission, the FCC. We are fortunate to welcome home Mr. Ryan Palmer for a review of the FCC policies re related to broadband. So if you, if you don't know anything about Ryan, let me tell you a little bit about him. Ryan was hired. Now, one of the things I learned, now I was education chair for 12 years, and I can tell you, acronym heaven is in education. The FCC runs a close second to that. Uh, he was hired as the chief of the Te Telecommunications Access Policy Division, or TAPD, uh, of the Wire Competition Bureau of the FCC in September of 2014. TAPD's primary mission is to advance the goal of universal service, that all Americans have ac access to robust, affordable broadband in voice services. Consistent with that mission, the division is responsible for developing the policies for administration and oversight of federal universal service fund, which is comprised of programs designed to ensure the access of affordable communications for schools, libraries, healthcare providers, rural and low income consumers. TAPD also develops policies for administration and oversight of the contribution uh, system which is a system in, by which the Commission's federal uni universal service programs are funded. And prior to that, uh, prior to coming to the FCC, he served as the commissioner for the West Virginia Public Service Commission from 2010 to 2014. During that time, he was deeply involved in their national association. Um, and I also remember him as uh, the deputy chief counsel for the governor of the state of West Virginia, Joe Manchin. And uh, he also was uh, employed as an attorney and aide for Commissioner Charlotte Lane at the United States International Trade Commission. Well, I could go on and on about his uh, accolades and the things that he knows, but let's just suffice it to say, we have a West Virginian working for us in D.C. on the FCC, and let me introduce to you Ryan Palmer. Thank you very much, Senator. I appreciate those kind words and, and your leadership on these issues. Um, to Sarah and everyone who organized this, thank you, Sarah. Um, she's a friend and, and former colleague, and it's such an impressive event. And two of the most important issues for our state right now, obviously the opioid epidemic and our broadband, ditching the digital divide for our communities and getting broadband where we don't have it today. So thank you for everyone for pulling this together. Um, before I start, I have to give the disclaimer I'm speaking for myself, not for the commissioners at the FCC. But that being said, I think I have a lot of useful information that I'll try to get to you all in the next 15 minutes or so. I know lunch, lunch is coming up soon, so we'll try to be concise with what we're doing. Um, so I'm Ryan Palmer. I'm the chief, as the senator said, chief of the division called the Telecommunications Access Policy Division at the FCC. And we work on universal service policy issues, basically broadband issues every day. Uh, I was born in Morgantown, grew up in St. Albans. I've lived, worked, and studied all over the state. 
So the issue of broadband access for our state is personal to me. Uh, also on a personal note, I should say that as a West Virginian, I'm extremely thankful for both of our, some of our previous speakers with Senator Manchin and Senator Capito for what they're doing to try to push the issue of broadband in rural America forward. We have two of the most engaged senators in the country when it comes to engagement with the FCC, I promise you. And they're both tenacious in their pursuit. And, and as a West Virginian, even though it sometimes leads to more work for me or longer nights, it's always a good thing because it means we're, we're pushing things forward in a, in a positive way. So I thank them. Also, a little bit off script, but I remember Senator Manchin noted earlier uh, that a bi the two bipartisan issues that he sees, military and opioid epidemic. I would say maybe there's a third, and that is bridging the digital divide for rural America. It's political, yes, everything in Washington's political, but it's nonpartisan because it's not about whether you're a Republican or whether you're a Democrat. It's what are the communities where I live, what do they have? Do they have broadband? Can my kids get online when they go home at night? Can I search for jobs? Can I live the same life that everybody else in the country expects? We should be able to expect the same thing for our communities and and we're working on that. So I really do see that as, once again, political but not partisan, and that's a, po that's a benefit. It gives me uh, hope that we're going to be able to solve this problem. So why is this conversation so important? Why are we here today? We know that broadband is the defining infrastructure of the 21st century, much like, like railroads, highways, and rivers before us. Today, we know that broadband networks facilitate economic and social activity. Indeed, access to broadband means access to opportunity. Even more importantly, broadband networks ignite new possibilities. Thanks to broadband, what is often unimaginable one day is commonplace the next. We need to look no further than our phones, our watches, our Fitbits, and, and many other things. So uh, that's why it's such an honor to be here today and to work on these issues every day, because it takes these type of situations where we have the public sector and the private sector coming together to really best attack these problems. So uh, it's great to be a part of this. So that being said, let me tell you a little bit about my division. I will speak a little quickly, so I try to get everything in here. Um, and some important things that are happening currently in the world of universal service that will impact West Virginia. Uh, what, like the Senator said, I manage TAPD. Uh, it's an acronym for Telecommunications Access Policy Division. We, we, we try to bridge the digital, digital divide using the Universal Service Fund, which works to bring broadband to schools, libraries, rural health care facilities, eligible low-income individuals, and rural and underserved communities throughout the country. Uh, in 2017, we dispersed about $8.84 billion through our programs, with over half of that going through the Connect America Fund, which is something we're going to focus on again here in a minute. Uh, our work to bridge the digital divide is very challenging, like we all know, but it's rewarding. And fortunately, our chairman, Chairman Pai, shares our passion and my division's passion. Uh, in his very first remarks to the FCC staff after he became chairman, he noted that his, one of his top priorities would be to close the digital divide, which he personally defined as the gap between those who use cutting-edge communication services and those who do not. The chairman has also said that closing the digital divide will require, once again, not just private sector leadership, but public sector efforts as well. I would go one step further and say on the, on the public side, it takes the federal government, the state, the local government, the local business communities, everyone who can possibly play a role, the Broadband Enhancement Council, we all have to be part of this conversation because we play different roles in this space. And then we need to get together with the thought leaders in the private sector so we all know what the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. So hopefully a little bit of information I'm going to share now will tell you something that we're doing, which will hopefully can, along with your efforts, can, can have an impact. So this summer, uh, we concluded our Connect America Fund Phase two reverse auction, which awarded about $1.49 billion to augment private investment in order to bring broadband to approximately 713,000 individual and discrete locations around the country, small businesses and residential locations. We pulled this off after years and quite frankly, decades of planning. Uh, and this auction was the first multiple round reverse auction to allocate, and I'm gonna get a little technical here, to allocate ongoing support for fixed broadband service in the world. And the world is actually watching just on Friday. I met with a delegation from Nigeria with their communications commissioners and senators from Nigeria, specifically asking, 
How did the auction go? What are you learning? What's next? What can we learn from it so maybe we can recreate it? And so not only has it been a success so far at this stage of the operation, but we're learning a ton on hopefully ways we can reutilize uh, what we're learning here in the future and continue to push broadband out to rural America. Uh, in the auction, there were over 974,000 rural and high-cost locations up for, up for, for competition, uh, and they were all eligible for support. These high-cost locations were all in areas that are not served by a competitor. These are areas where there's no competitor with speeds of 10 megabits per second up or faster in those areas. So basically, absent universal service funding, broadband deployment in these areas would not be economically feasible. The commission used an auction, an auction mechanism and competition among bidders to efficiently allocate the, the funds and drive down prices as much as possible. So we figured out where it would be served and, and for how much. Uh, each bid in the auction represented a commitment by a bidder to deploy fixed broadband and voice services in a particular uh, census block group area in, in exchange for a certain amount of money. Uh, in order to maximize competition, the auction was technology neutral, which was a very important part of this auction, uh, but it used a weighting system. So the amount of support that you would receive would also be dependent on what kind of speed are we planning on offer, offering, what latency will be there, are there usage caps and other things involved. <coughs> and then we use this formula to conduct the auction and allocate resources to the area, these areas. Uh, bidding in the auction started on July 24th, concluded on August 21st of this year. It started high, like a reverse auction, and went down with each round. And all in all, like I said, we settled on $1.49 billion in support over 10 years uh, to bidders committing to offer broadband to over 713,000 unique locations across 45 states. There were 103 winning bidders in the auction, which include many different kinds. Once again, we said we're technology neutral. We had many different types of companies, wireless internet service providers, rural electric co-ops, cable operators, local exchange carriers, and even satellite a satellite company involved. And one inter interesting fact to just show you how sort of our, the model and our auction worked, the, the original aggregate amount of funds that we had reserved pursuant to what our model had calculated or said that might be needed to serve these areas that won was about $5 billion. But over the auction and through the competition, we were able to drive that down and get commitments to serve broadband in these areas for $1.49 billion. So the approach of competition and letting private industry get out there and, and compete for it, we believe that has worked. And we, can, we always want to do better. We're going to continue to learn, see what we can learn. But uh, we're very encouraged by what we've seen. So the results that we know, of these 713,000 locations, 99.75% of these locations uh, will be served with speeds of at least 25 megabits per second up and three down within six years, 100% of those locations. 53% of the locations will have 100 megabits per second or faster, and a good 19%, including locations in West Virginia, will receive gigabit surface when this process is over. So once again, that represented the different companies in different situations, bidding on different areas, and trying to maximize the speeds and latency with a limited pool of money and, and let the auction work, work out, and that's, those are the results that we're seeing. So specifically for West Virginia, what does this mean? The auction is gonna infuse about $12 million that's been committed over the next 10 years into West Virginia, which will result in 7,789 locations in the state receiving broadband where it currently does not exist. Three companies were winning bidders in West Virginia. We had CityNet, Hardy Tele Telecommunications, and Viasat. Um, of course, one logical next question is, what areas of the state, where will this happen? Can I see that? And fortunately, we have a detailed interactive map that will show you not only where the winning bid bidders are located, but also where the areas that were included in the auction that, that nobody bid on or were not won in the auction, where those locations were. Uh, it's a great map. I was playing around with it last week, and it's, you know, I was, of course, zoomed in right on West Virginia, went right to St. Albans, where my mom lives, and, you know, would look all around the state, and you can get some good information. It tells a couple stories. One, where are we going to make progress? Where can we, can we expect this? But two, it also gives you an idea of how much more work we have to go, which is, is significant. Um, if you want to see this map, there's a really long uh, URL, so what's the easiest thing to do, I, I tested this out again this morning, you can just go to Google, like everybody else, and type in CAF Phase 2 Auction Map, K 
CAF is C A F all capitals Connect America Fund. And if you're if you like mapping or you're interested in checking it out, it might be worth a few minutes of your time to, to play around. So that's what happened this summer. That just happened. We're still we're still you know we're still working through that. Since then, since the winning bidders were named, uh, they all had to submit long form applications, which are which our staff they were due on the 15th, so just recently of October, which my staff and, and others in the building are out now reviewing to make sure these companies can follow through with what they've committed to doing. There was a, an initial scrub, so to speak, and now we're doing a little more. A deeper dive just to make sure they can do what they said so they can get to work and get started and we can have them approved to receive this funding and so they so they can get to work um, our, in, in addition to reviewing those uh, once they've been authorized uh, our staff will make sure that they build out their networks to and begin offering service not just build out and begin offering service with to 40 percent of the locations within three years and to all 20 percent a year after that until six years from now they will be required to reach 100 percent of those locations but then the funding goes on for 10 years recognizing that there's obviously more costs uh, to come data on the locations that will be served uh, must be filed with us and penalties can be imposed for failure to meet or reach your build out milestones so winning bidders will be required to file specific lat long coordinates which will then also be mapped in a different map so and turned around it's going to be public facing map for everyone to see now we know here are the specific residential locations and small business locations that, and the speeds that they have now so we can see that which is useful and then we can also see once again where can we go next how can we augment this to continue to, to push things out uh, another important factor is we do have a system of coming back and auditing and checking the speeds. so if they say they're giving you gigabit service we're going to make sure that they're providing that that they want to receive this funding and the commission released an order earlier earlier this year discussing the process and the engineering that we'll be doing to, to test that out. So moving forward, the success and lessons learned from the Connect America Fund Phase Two auction are already helping inform policy making for future commit for the commissioners and for the future commission. It will do so as well. And for future auctions, we have others that are lined up in the future. The Mobility Fund Phase Two auction, which is something both of our senators are very interested in, uh, the Remote Areas Fund, and also Phase Three of the Connect America. So these are all things that our chairman talks about as you know what he sees coming in the future and it's all sort of part of our longer term plan on how to have the biggest impact on these issues with what we have is a limited pool of money might sound like a lot of money it is a lot of money uh, spending 8.84 billion dollars last year but is we have a big country and a lot of need and and that's and so we're doing the most we can get the my term you know biggest bang for our buck and being the smartest with that money to uh, encourage, you know, push out and also encourage private investment to go along with it. And we're trying to, to do the best we can with the amount of money that we're allocating from the commissioners. Uh, so that's CAF phase two auction. I'm gonna give a couple quick things that we're doing that might be of interest to West Virginia. And if there's any questions, if we have time, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, in March, the FCC started a rulemaking proceeding considering ways to improve and simplify how our rate of return eligible telecommunications carriers are funded. These are the smaller, more rural carriers around the state, or around the country, but also very common in our state. Uh, as part of that, the commission is also considering directly whether they should expand the budget for these carriers. And that would definitely have a direct impact on our state and our communities. Chairman Powell recently said that he intends to circulate a draft order no later than the end of this year, so the, the time is winding down, that would increase spending for these carriers to make up for funding shortfalls that have kicked in recently. Uh, he also said that the FCC must take a close look at expanding access to and predictable funding for these rate of return carriers. And I think that predictable word is very important there when we hear from the carriers. It's, it's good to get money at any time, but they need to know it's coming over the long term uh, so they can do business plans and, and financing and everything they need to really uh, get the ball rolling. So stay tuned on that, on that issue, but like I said, the chairman is committed to circulating an order by the end of the year. The SEC is also exploring the creation of an experimental connected care pilot program to support the delivery of advanced telehealth services to low-income Americans. As we discussed uh, earlier, my division's top priority is the digital divide, and nowhere is this more critical than our healthcare sector right now. We, 
we all see it, right? The challenges in West Virginia. We see the hospital, rural hospitals closing and healthcare facilities closing their doors, um, and, and it's a difficult situation. However, innovative broadband-enabled telehealth technologies are allowing patients to receive uh, service where they are, in the home or in a local, a local uh, community center. And these services can lead to better health outcomes and, quite frankly, save money, not just for the patients, but also for the healthcare facilities. And it's one, the, the momentum behind these programs on Capitol Hill are just growing every day. Uh, everyone in, on the Hill realizes that telehealth, especially in rural America, is extremely important for us to have thriving communities. And so we play a little role in that. Our fund is about $581 million a year for a rural healthcare program, but in this pilot, uh, we sought comment on creating the program to promote the use of these broadband-enabled telehealth services, not only among low-income families, but also amongst veterans, uh, with a focus on services delivered directly to the patient. So as we speak today, FC staff back in the office reviewing the comments that have been filed in that notice of inquiry, and we're thinking about looking at the best ideas and trying to figure out the best way proposals we can move forward to the commissioners uh, to try to continue to push this important issue forward, which... Uh, in particular, Commissioner Carr is uh, very interested in. This is a big issue for him and, and a priority. So I'll take a breath. Sorry I spoke so fast, but I wanted to make sure I get some of that information out there for you all. Um, like I said from the outset, uh, I'm a West Virginian. My family's here just up the road. These issues are personal to me, and there's something that's the reason I'm so happy and proud to have the job at the FCC where I do, where we can try to make an impact on these issues, and why I'm so willing to, you know, I have a great staff and we all work very hard, but we know at the end of the day there's a, there's a reason we're doing it, and there, there, there will be benefit um, to our schools and libraries and our communities and our low-income individuals, and, and so we're very uh, excited to be a part of this, but we are a part, and, and that is all. We need everyone here working together like you're doing so you can know what we're doing. So when you plan something, we, don't, we never want to spend money and duplicate efforts. We want to make sure we do it in the most logical way. And I think having these conversations and communicating is one of the most important parts of that. So once again, thank you to everyone who organized this event. Thank you for having me. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. A lot going on at the FCC. But um, so if, I, if it's not in my division, then I'll be happy to take it back and follow up with you.